In this, the third pillar of army design, we're gonna talk about probability and how to use probability to make you more effective in your games of Warhammer 40,000. Now, one of my favorite puzzles to give people is how many intercessors, Primaris intercessors, armed with bolt rifles, does it take to kill a squad of five Primaris intercessors, based on math. If you wanted to statistically um, on average, kill a squad of five Primaris Incessors, how many do you need? Now, we did the calculation, yep. so James did it. Here's a hint, it's not five. <laughs> and, but, which, but it's so funny, people think that. They go, if I've got five Incessors, they can kill five Incessors. Did you know that actually, if you play an entire five turn game, one squad of five Incessors just shooting at range, are statistically unlikely to kill a squad of five Incessors. In fact, mathematically, um, according to math, it takes 30 Primaris Incessors, one round of shooting to kill five Primaris Incessors. Because of the two wounds, because of the three up save, um, because of the chances of hitting. It is significantly more than you can imagine. And we see this time and time again. You know, if you've got a squad of three Eradicators who have six shots hitting on threes, only four of them are gonna hit. At a strength of eight against a toughness of eight, only 50% of them are gonna wound. So if I'm shooting a, a tank with a toughness of eight, I've now got two wounds. That tank is probably not gonna get a save, but now when I roll those two wounds, I'm gonna average seven damage unless I'm in half range. And seven damage does not kill anything with toughness eight in the game, which means a squad of three eradicators firing twice doesn't kill a vehicle in a single round of firing. But I see people all the time go, six shots, that's gonna kill that tank. Yeah. It's not gonna kill the no. tank. In fact, it's probably gonna take two squads of eradicators, six eradicators to significantly be able to kill a tank. And that's only on average. Average, if you get unlucky, I'm an unlucky player. For whatever reason, <laughs> my dice rolls don't always go the way I want. Hence the pillar of probability. <laughs> Hence the pillar of probability to remind me, to remind me that I have to factor this in when I'm designing my armies. I actually calculate a factor of two thirds. I don't want it to be statistically average. I want it two thirds in my favor. Yeah. So I won't do anything unless it's a three or higher, right? I, I need a three <laughs> or higher and a six or eight happening. And so everything I do is based on probability. Now, there are a number of different ways to do probability. For example, a lot, of strength, uh, a lot of shots that hit on six is sometimes better than one shot that hits on twos. So you, but you gotta sit down and really think about that. Remember that six shots hitting on sixes is gonna happen once in six times. One shot, Hitting on twos is actually not as good. Yeah, that's Bec one third. Yeah, it's so. Or hitting on twos, that's two thirds. Yeah, exactly. So six shots hitting on sixes, one of those is probably going to happen. Whereas the alternate one shot hitting on twos, not so good. You actually don't have as much of a chance yeah. because one in six times that's going to fail, right? So when you think like that, like, and that's how I think about all my games. Whenever I'm playing, I'm like, okay, what is the statistical chances of this actually happening? Which brings us to buffs. The key to being good in Warhammer is buffs. You wanna be able to reroll ones, you wanna be able to get plus one to hit. Anything you can do, plus one to wound is more effective than almost anything in the game. It's like my favorite. Because it jumps you up because of the way the chart works, right? Because a strength four against the toughness of five, plus one to wound boosts you up to an effective strength of five. But strength four against the toughness of seven, plus one to wound, gives you an effective strength yeah. of seven. Yeah. So it's a massive jump. It's one of the most effective buffs in the game. Which brings us to probably the most underused and overpowered unit, which is the Master of Sanctity uh, for the Space Marines, the Chaplain. The Chaplain for the Space Marine Army has the ability to give plus one to hit with, I think it's Catechism of Fire, um, and plus one to wound with one of his other ones. I forget the, the exact names at the moment of filming this, but the, he's got two abilities. And as a master of sanctity, he, uh, if, you, if you select him and give him the trait that's plus one to, uh, to perform his litanies, he will be able to perform these on a two up, which is almost always gonna happen, right? In a, in a, six, in a five turn game, you got a very good chance of both of those happening every single turn. Maybe once or twice you'll miss one, but that's about it. Because they're triggered on a two or higher, they're likely to happen. Giving a unit plus one to hit and plus one to wound is so massive, um, even if you pick two different units, that it's gonna significantly um, you know, impact your ability to damage your opponent and to hit them on the first turn of the game. So um, a, a chaplain with its aura buffs is one of the, or, or its selective buffs, is one of the best things you can do in the game. So whenever I'm building an army, what I'll be doing for probability is I'll be thinking, how can I have one unit buff 
multiple units. So an example of this again would be for my Death Watch. Um, one of my Death Watch tactics is I will pick a Death Watch captain with a jump pack and I'll give him the Relic Storm Shield, uh, I think it's called the Aegis or something, um, the e a Angelic Aegis. And what that does is it's a better Storm Shield that gives a five up and vulnerable save to any models nearby him. And I'll surround him with six Inceptors. The Inceptors are the jump pack troops with the double plasma guns. Now, the captain's natural buff is to give them rerolls of one. Well, their plasma guns, rerolling one with plasma is always good, right? Because I can overcharge them and get a lot of shots off. But now, because of his relic, which doesn't cost me points, I've now got those Inceptors a five up and vulnerable save. So now, one of my most powerful units that naturally has a toughness of five because they're in that better armor, um, and has multiple wounds, wow. now has a five up and vulnerable save. So I boosted their durability. So the probability of my Inceptors surviving to be able to blast with plasma, and then being able to blast with that plasma and not explode is very, very high. My God. Not to mention the fact now, I've also put a jump captain with a thunder hammer and storm shield right next to my opponents. Now, this changes the whole way I play these guys. Because of the entire four pillars, I know the correct move is not to teleport them in. Because if I teleport them in, they only arrive on turn two and I don't get a very hard hit. If I put them on the board on turn one, I've got the invulnerability, their natural save, and just being clever about where I position them to make sure they can't get targeted. The Inceptors stop you shooting the captain. The five up invulnerable save helps keep the Inceptors alive. Plus they have a natural toughness of five. Plus I can put them behind cover. So the probability of them being effective on the first turn is actually pretty high. If I get the first turn of the game, I can move 12 inches and their 18 inch range of their guns puts them in range of almost everything. Yeah. I blast with the plasma fire, re-rolling ones. If I go second, my opponent might not be able to shoot me because I'm behind cover. I can jump over the cover because they fly. My invulnerable save keeps me alive if they can position into a position where they can shoot. And then I get to blast with plasma and charge with the thunder hammer guy. So no matter what happens, the probability of me doing what I want is very high. All of this stuff I just imagine on the other side with chaos and I'm like trembling. Right. <laughs> so scary. yeah, so it's a very, so the probability is incredibly high. And so whenever I'm looking at an army, I'm thinking, what is the probability of it actually happening? So I know that if I'm playing that, I don't want to be jump packing those guys in. And you can look at any unit in your army and just think, what is the probability of it doing what I want? And where do I need to, to make it so it's most effective? So for example, if I've got guys that have a short range gun, I don't want them to be able to be seen on the first turn of the game, right? So if I've got, say, a, a squad of Chosen with Melter guns, they have a 12 inch range. Um, I don't want to put them out in the open where they can be seen. I'll put them behind a wall because I know I'm going to have to move to get them in range. So I may as well move them out of cover and make them just completely unshootable in the first turn of the game, right? Or as I said earlier, put them inside a dread claw like this thing here so they can't be seen on the first turn. But when they arrive on the battlefield, they have to be nine inches away, but their 12 inch range of their melter guns means they're going to blast in that initial turn. Yeah, that's something actually now that you mention it, that's something I've really started taking into consideration with my probability is terrain and the, the you know, addition that it gives in your probability. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah. And, but we can go a step further as well by thinking about the phases of the game. For example, we spoke about the dread claw with the, the Meltagun Chosen inside it, yeah. right? What if I change it a bit? What if I put Meltagun Chosen inside the dread claw, but I also put a Chaos Sorcerer inside that dread claw? Okay. And I put a Smash Captain, a Chaos Smash Captain inside there, so I could take maybe Obsidious Malix, right? Who's okay. the, the, the character that comes with a Thunder Hammer. Mm -hmm. So now let's look at this. My, my Dreadclaw turns up in the movement phase, the Chosen jump out in the movement phase, along with the Psychic and Obsidious Malix, but now it's the Psychic phase. Mm -hmm. Now my Psych is on the board. My Psych wasn't on the board in my opponent's turn. He is on the board now, casts Prescience on the Chosen, mm -hmm. enabling them to fire, casts Warp Time on Obsidious Malix, enabling him to move six inches. Now that nine inch distance that was impossible for him to make is three. now three inches away. <laughs> so now my chosen blast with the melter guns, plus one to hit because of prescience, re-rolling ones because of Obsidious Malix. Suddenly the chance of those melter guns firing off is really, really high. Obsidious Malix has a plasma pistol that's now well in range, and then he charges with a thunder hammer. Now, I've also got that sorcerer that I could maybe charge with, or the sorcerer could have a combi melter, giving me another yeah. melter gun, which would also be re-rolling ones, uh, oh no, maybe not because of core. We don't know about that. Right now it is, but when it yeah. comes out eventually, maybe not. But the point is that's a lot of melting on fire and a plasma gun and charging and a psyker. 
um, who use warp time and prescience to be able to be effective. And now Obsidious Malix is touching something in close combat that doesn't get to fire in its turn. Probability of a predator firing after Obsidious Malix charged it in close combat, very low. Now, yes, the predator can shoot Obsidious Malix because he's in close combat, but it's gonna get minus one to hit. And after he's punctured it with that Thunder Hammer, the probability of it hitting on threes is low anyway. So he's probably damaged it down to hitting on fours. And with minus one to hit, it hits on fives. Even with four Laz Cannons shooting into Obsidious Malix, hitting on fives, we can presume only one of those Laz Cannons might hit. And even if it wounds, he has a 50-50 chance of dodging it. And even if he doesn't dodge it, it's going to statistically do 3.5 wounds, which isn't enough to kill it. No. Meaning, probability says Obsidious Maddox, Obsidious Malix will survive close combat with that Predator. Wow. So he's damaged it. He can't be shot because he's touching a Predator. Yeah. The Predator can't kill him. If the opponent doesn't leave with that Predator in close combat, Obsidious Malix will finish off the Predator in your opponent's close combat phase, yep. allowing him to be free to charge something else. So again, that's what probability is. That is a, a great example of how that works. Um, now, every army has the ability to, to look at probability and calculate things like this. Right? For example, we could look at um, the Sisters of Battle, for example. The Sisters of Battle, um, they can have multi-melters. They've got these heavy weapon uh, guns that have a ton of multi-melters. Once again, with their acts of faith, and by making sure that we put them near a cannon to let them reroll ones, we can put them inside a rhino, we can drive them down the battlefield to make sure they're alive on the first turn of the game, your opponent can't shoot them off the board, and then we can jump out of the rhino, and we can use the cannon to make sure they get that firepower to boost their chances of shooting. But we could go a step further. What if we wanted to be even more accurate? Remember, we're gonna get minus one to hit with the multi-melters. What if instead, we took heavy flamers? Now, heavy flamers, they're a heavy weapon giving you minus one to hit when you move, but they automatically hit. So the minus one to hit is irrelevant. Yeah. Now we jump yeah, out of the Rhino with these heavy flamers. And again, a Rhino will hold five models. We can put two heavy weapon squads in there, giving us eight heavy flamers or eight D6 automatic strength five hits at AP minus one. That is a ton of damage against a horde army that once again, probability of that happening is very, very high, providing we can get to the battlefield. So we put them inside a rhino, drive down the battlefield, your opponent shoots the rhino. Maybe they kill the rhino, maybe they don't. It doesn't matter because either way, next turn, out come the sisters with heavy flamers and they annihilate anything, right? So this is a classic way to make sure we use probability. I love heavy flamers. Um, another way that I've done this as well is uh, with Imperial Guard with uh, the Sentinels. And the Sentinels are these like higher toughness little vehicles that you can put one gun on them. Again, if you put a ton of heavy flamers, you run up and you just torch everything with heavy flamers. Heavy flamers, because they automatically hit, are a, a natural benefit for any army that has a low ballistic skill, right? You want to be looking at using heavy flamers as often as possible. Yeah, I mean, auto hit is 100% probability. Right. So now, um, there are other ways we can look at probability as well. So for example, if you're playing an army that naturally gives you minus one to hit, right? Let's just say you're playing against Alpha Legion or you're playing against Elder and they're giving you minus one to hit with everything. Um, you should probably be advancing with your assault weapons as standard because the game doesn't allow you to stack minus ones. Mm -hmm. So there's, people have a habit. Well, I don't want to move and advance with my Melter Gun because I'm going to get minus one to hit. Well, if your opponent's gonna give you minus one to shoot anyway, yep. like maybe you're playing against um, Creations of Bile and they like using Monstrous Visage, which gives yeah. you minus one to hit. Okay, great. In that case, all of my Assault Marines now move at six plus D6 inches yep. because I may as well give myself that minus one to hit or all my heavy weapon squads suddenly run all over the battlefield because the minus one to hit is irrelevant. You're gonna give me minus one to hit anyway. Yep. And so you may as well preload that minus one into your strategy. So that's another way of thinking about this of like, Okay, I'm now a more mobile army because I, I can't get minus two to hit, so yep. I may as well pick it up, right? So probability is thinking like this and sitting down and doing the math in advance. Every time I've met anyone that has an army that is consistently failing, it's because they've never done the math. They've never sat down and looked at it. It's always like, yeah, but if I get in combat, I'll kill them. Yep. Yeah, but, but if this happens. And I remember that I did this with Centur it's Centurion, Assault Centurion uh, squads. So the Assault Centurion squads are really good in close combat, but they have a movement of four inches. I could just never get them in close combat. Eventually, I started putting them inside a Storm Eagle, flying down the battlefield, and then getting them out because they just weren't doing anything. When I eventually did that tactic, it was destroying people because yeah. now they could reach. So that's it for the third pillar, which brings us to the fourth pillar, which is range. That's a nice segue there, talking about those Centurions, because <laughs> the probability of them succeeding at the beginning of the game was very, very low. So the, the fourth pillar of army design is uh, the range part of the army design. You've got to make sure your army is effective against all three ranges. So let's look at that video next. 